right, good evening, Calvary. How are we? Doing okay, very good. Hey, if you don't know, my name is Brian Howard. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and it is good to be with you this week. If you have your Bible, I want to open up to 2 Chronicles 20. Uh, if, you're no, if you have no idea where 2 Chronicles 20 is, there is no Christian shame in going to the table of contents and looking at it. This is in the Old Testament, not Corinthians, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, if you're heading there in your Bible or on your phone. Um, I don't know about you guys, uh, but uh, I had one of those weeks, um, one of those weeks where you had all these intentions of like all these things you were going to do, and then um, all that happened was more stuff got added to that list and nothing got taken away. Hallelujah. Make some noise if you had one of those weeks. Okay. Okay. So, so this is the week I had. Things were just kind of going wild and I, I knew I was preaching tonight. And so what I did was I opened up the text and, and for us here at Calvary, the most important thing is that we love the text and know the text and open up the text. And so I studied the text and did all of that and then was rolling into late afternoon here um, and realized I had no introduction to the text. Like, I had nothing to say before getting to the Bible, and it was kind of one of these moments I was like, well, I could just open up and go. But then this crazy thing happened. Hey, here's what happened this afternoon. I had three conversations. Three conversations that really got me thinking about actually where this text is going to take us tonight, where this text is going to land us tonight. Um, the first was a conversation with a colleague of mine here at work um, who was just celebrating um, that she had landed her dream job. Like she had landed a job and she had landed a position that she had wanted for a long time, that she was going after, that she wanted, and that she ultimately had. Like she got this very thing she wanted and she was excited. And so I was thinking about this girl and I was thinking about the fact that at Thanksgiving is a week from today. So I was thinking about this, Thanksgiving, a week from today. Um, and at her Thanksgiving table this year, I was just thinking about the fact that this girl was just going to be filled with gratitude, Right? Like when they went around the table and everyone does the thing that you probably do and my family does, what are you grateful for in the last year? This girl had something to say. This girl who was serving here at Calvary, who got to do this thing she's wanted to do, would have something to say. I got this dream role, this dream position, this dream job that I wanted. So that was the first conversation I had. Second conversation. Second conversation, I was talking to a guy who is in the process of applying for this job he wants. And he's not quite there yet. He hasn't quite achieved it, but he just overcame a major hurdle. And so in some ways he's celebrating, but he's not quite there yet. And so he's kind of happy and at the same time realizes there's this long road ahead of him. And I'm talking to him and I'm thinking about his, Chris, or his Thanksgiving table next week. Like in some ways he's thanking God and going, I'm so grateful I overcame this hurdle. But he's also aware that there's more to come. And then the third conversation I had this afternoon was this one. The third conversation I had this afternoon was I was talking to this guy, and this guy works for a church down in Los Angeles. And he was talking to me about the church he works for, and it just seems like in every way this is a toxic environment. Like things aren't good, people are kind of manipulating others, people are lying to him. It's just kind of this bad, toxic environment. And I looked across the table from him and said, listen, with everything I have within me, I'm hearing you say that this is toxic and you need to get out which is easy for me to say but difficult for him to hear because it means uprooting his life and quitting his job and having no income and leaving a situation that's toxic but safe. And so here I am thinking about this guy. Uh, like if this girl is celebrating because she just landed something awesome and this guy's kind of in the middle because it's kind of awesome but there's still a long road ahead of him. Here's this third guy and he's coming to Thanksgiving this next week and he sits around the table and they're asking what are you grateful for and he probably has some things but in the back of his mind he's got this thought of by next Thanksgiving what's going to happen? Like what's going to happen as I transition in my life? And I was just this afternoon, even as I was prepping for this and just getting dinner and coming in, just thinking about these three conversations I had, thinking about these three things that came together. And here was my thought. My thought was for all of you. Like I really believe over the next week, and maybe it's Thanksgiving of next week, or maybe you have one of these ridiculous and absurd and wonderful Friendsgivings going on. Some of you are pointing like this will happen at some point, and you'll get around the table, and you'll say, what are we grateful for? And I just want to say that I really believe some of you are here. Like, I think some of you had the year of your life, and that thing you've wanted, that thing you've been after finally happened. You finally graduated. You finally got the girl. The guy finally texted you or noticed you. Or you finally got engaged. Or you finally got the job, or, or, or something finally happened. I think some of you are celebrating. But, but I wonder if tonight I could talk to not just the people who are celebrating something for Thanksgiving, but I wonder if I could talk to those middle people. 
I wonder if there are some of you in this room where things have been going okay, but there's still a long road ahead of you. And you're going into this Thanksgiving and you're grateful for what's happened, but you're anxious about what's ahead. Or, or perhaps there's some of you in this room who are in this spot, who are in the place where you know the next year of your life is going to be filled with transition and turmoil and newness. You know there's some scary, unknown things ahead of you. And you're looking forward going, by Thanksgiving 2018, my life's going to look different. I just don't know how. And tonight, tonight I want to talk to you. I want to talk to those of you who are here tonight going, by this time next year, my life's going to look different. I just don't know how yet. I just don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know how that's going to happen. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's the story, the story in the Old Testament that you may have heard, but you probably haven't before. It's not one we hear a ton, but, but here's what I'll say. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, begins this way. It says, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Mennonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. So you're going, who's Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat is the king over uh, Jerusalem, the king over Judea, the southern kingdom of God's people. God's people have this kingdom, and the capital city is Jerusalem. And what happens over and over and over again in the book of Chronicles, which is the chronicles of the kings of Israel, is that basically what happens is the people of God get attacked, the people of God look to God, God saves them, the people of God forget about God, go into some bad stuff, get attacked, they look to God, and it cycles over and over and over. And this is one of those moments. And the guy who's in charge right now, his name is Jehoshaphat. And it says that he sees these people. They're rising up. They came to wage war against him. In fact, in verse 2, it says, Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom and the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already on Hezizan, Hezizan mm, Tamar, that is En Gedi. <laughs> so here's what's happening. There's a vast army that's compiling against them. There's this big group of people who are standing against them, and it's terrifying, and it's scary, and they're looking and staring this down. They're thinking about this thing that's about to happen. Jehoshaphat becomes aware that things are about to get messy for him. Uh, again, sometimes maybe we think of war, and maybe, uh, maybe you are a veteran. If you are, uh, just in light of even last week, thank you for that. We love you as a veteran. Uh, but for the rest of us who didn't fight, we've just seen wars on TV. It's a clean process to us. And it's clean because we haven't been there and we haven't experienced that. But those of you who have, and especially people who experienced it here, know that this is about to be a bloody affair. It's about to be a messy affair. This isn't clean. It's not simple. It's scary. It's unknown. Uh, like I think of this for <coughs> some of us as we head into this next year. Uh, I wonder if for some of you there's some unclean, kind of scary, unknown things coming. Like, I wonder if for some of you in the next year, you'll be making decisions uh, about what college you'll go to or transfer to or what grad school you'll go to. Uh, I wonder if there's anyone in the room in the next year who has to make a decision about what you're going to major in. Like, you've been in college majoring in naps, and now it's time to put your big boy pants on. Like, I wonder if for some of you that's about to happen. Or, or here's actually the scariest thing. High school kids always think graduating high school and going off to college is the scariest thing. Not so. Graduating college and having no idea what to do with your life is the scariest thing. And some of you are about to hit that in the next year. And you're going to sit around the table with grandma and grandpa, and they're going to be like, what are you going to do with your life? And you're like, I don't know. Is Netflix an option? Like, that's all you can think of. And so some of you are standing on the edge of that, and then some of you are a little further on in life, and you're trying to land not just like a job that pays you eleven twenty-five an hour and you hate, but you're trying to find a job you love, or you're in a job that you love, but you're trying to figure out how to advance in it. I wonder if there's some of you, the next year you're looking out and going, listen, I'm, I'm really just done being single. Like, ladies, I wonder if some of you are just looking into this next year going, I am so done being single, and I want this next year. I just want to find a guy who loves the Lord and loves me and who's after my heart and is going to take care of me. Uh, I wonder if for some of you it's health stuff. Like, there's something going on in your body, and you're just going, like, how is this? Is this always going to be this way? Is it always, am I ever going to get he healthy? Am I ever going to get well? Am I always going to be sick? I, I wonder if for some of you, you roll into this Thanksgiving, and that addiction that was there last Thanksgiving is still there. That habit, that sin, that stronghold in your life is still there. Again, I look at Jehoshaphat here, and he's looking at this massive, scary army in front of him. And I'm just convinced there are people in this room, you look at the year ahead of you, and there's 
something massive and scary and difficult staring you down. And I hope this story tonight encourages your heart. I hope this story tonight gives you something that you can say and believe and do as you head into this next year. It says this in verse 3. He's alarmed. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. I love verse 3 here. Because here's what you would expect it to say. You would expect it to say, alarmed, Jehoshaphat called all of his generals and said, let's figure this out, right? You would expect it to say, alarmed, Jehoshaphat went and hid in the castle to try not to die. Like, that's what you might expect. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat gets stressed and binge eats ice cream. Like, you would expect something like that, right? Alarmed, Jehoshaphat becomes overthinking everything. You would expect something like that. But that's not what happens here. See, Jehoshaphat doesn't go down this road of, I'm going to think about this. I'm going to obsess about this. I'm going to worry about this. I'm going to start talking about this. It says so clearly here in the text that he is alarmed, and Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And then he proclaims a fast, meaning he's going to get everyone to start praying around him. And I just wonder if some of you going into this next year would just be able to even confess this Thanksgiving. You are alarmed, you are concerned, you're worried, you're anxious about something coming up in your life, but you are, instead of overthinking it, instead of stressing about it, instead of being worried about it, you are going to inquire of the Lord and set your attention on him. It continues on this way in verse 4. It says, The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So here's what I love about this moment. There's this scary thing standing in front of Jehoshaphat, and he knows that he is ultimately responsible for it. Like, it's going to affect everyone, but he's the king, and he's in charge, and he's responsible for it. And so instead of stressing out and being worried about it and going into his own head, he starts to gather people around him. And I guess I just want to stand here tonight and talk to some of you who have this thing going on in your life that you're worried and anxious and overwhelmed about, but you've decided the best solution is to try to deal with it alone. And I just want to do everything I can tonight to plead with you to knock it off, to stop pretending that you've got this thing. To stop pretending that this will just eventually go away and it'll be better. To stop pretending that if you just stress out and think about it more, then things will get better. Like, that's that overthinking thing. And and here's the deal. We we talk about overthinking sometimes. Like, ah, I just overthink everything. And the tragedy is that some of you talk about that like it's a badge of honor. I'm going to meddle in your life a little bit. Knock it off. The whole overthinking thing. I think sometimes we use that as a badge of honor where we think if we're like, oh, I just overthink everything. I just overthink everything. Makes you sound like deep or profound. What it actually shows me is that you are recognizing you have no control over the situation. And so you think if you think about it enough, you'll suddenly have control. Listen, overthinking has never solved anything. Overthinking has never actually brought any good fruit in your life. The reason you're so miserable when you overthink everything is because you buy into the lie that your mind and your will controls the universe and not God. I want to call some of you tonight who walk down those roads where you overthink every possibility to stop flirting with that, to stop pretending that's okay, and to repent of that and say, no longer, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to bring men and women around me. I'm going to get into a small group. Like maybe some of you have been just kind of flirting on the edges of YA and you keep hearing about small groups where you're like, I don't need that. I don't want people involved in my life. And I just want to point you here to Jehoshaphat who's about to go through this miserable, scary, overwhelming, and anxiety riddled moment and he calls everyone around him and I just wonder if some of you need to hear this tonight that you need to bring people into the situation rather than pretending you've got this thing on your own here's how it continues in verse 5 it says Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord and in front of the new courtyard and he said So he gets up in front of everyone. There's this terrifying moment. This army stands against them. It's overwhelming. They're anxious. They're nervous. They're afraid. They are completely terrified. And he stands up and he gives a speech. But I'll tell you this. This speech is not what you'd expect in this moment. The speech, you might expect him to say one of two things. The first thing, you might expect him to kind of be like a politician who gets up there and goes, I know it sounds scary, but there's actually nothing to be worried about. Don't be afraid. You know, keep calm and carry on and just don't worry about it because nothing really scary is happening. He doesn't do that. 
Second thing you might expect him to do is to get up there and try to take control of the situation. To be like, listen, everyone, I'm afraid, you're afraid, and so let me be in charge, and I'll just manipulate everything so it turns out the way I want it to turn out. But that's not what he does either. He gives a speech, and he gives a speech in two parts. And I want you to see this speech by this man who's about to face something overwhelming, terrifying, and filled with anxiety and worry. Here's what he says. He says, Lord, the God of our ancestors. He, he's saying this to the people, but he's leading them before prayer. He says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms and the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and built up the sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether by the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before the temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us, and you will save us. He stands before the people, and he proclaims this about their God. He reminds the people, we've been here before, and God took care of us. We came into this land, and there were all these enemies, and God took care of us. No one could stood against him. No one could come against him. He destroyed everyone. God took care of us before. I wonder if for some of you going into Thanksgiving, the necessity of Thanksgiving this year is to remind yourself that God has taken care of you every step of the way, and he's not going to give up in 2018. I wonder if some of you need to remember that God has already been faithful in your life, and his track record of faithfulness allows you to walk with courage into the next year. There's a song we sing in our high school ministry and in our worship services here, and maybe you know it yourself. It's by Elevation Worship, and it's called, I Will Look Up. And there's this line that's been so compelling and moving to myself and so many others. It's this line, I will look back and see that you're faithful, and I'll look ahead believing you're able. And if that would be the posture of your heart, that is the posture of Jehoshaphat's prayer here. He's going, looking back, God was faithful. He took care of us. He brought us into the land. He's never failed us before, and he's going to be our refuge now. He gives a speech in two parts. Part one is, listen, God's been faithful before, but then I want you to see part two of the speech. It says in verse 10, it says, but now, notice that. <laughs> he's going, God, you've been faithful, but now. God, you brought me before, but, but, but now there's something scary going on. It says, now men from Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came here from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out from the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Listen, part one is this recognition that God has been faithful before and he's going to be faithful again. But part two, part two of the speech is this realization that what we face is real and what we face is scary. See, hear me on this. To go into this next year thinking about those things that overwhelm you in this life isn't some sort of like kind of cutesy pie in the sky Christianity where you just put a smile on your face and pretend everything's okay. Well, let me tell you something. That just has nothing to do with true, authentic Christian faith. You're just pretending everything's good, like hashtag blessed, all is well, praise is up. Like none of that has anything to do with the Bible. This idea that everything's good and you're never scared and you're never overwhelmed and you're never anxious, it may be found somewhere. It just doesn't come from this book. Because people all over this book are terrified. They're scared. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know what's going to happen to them. You recognizing, yes, God's been faithful, but I'm afraid it is what this speech is about. He's been faithful, I'm afraid, but then I just want you to hear the next sentence. And in fact, I love this next sentence so much, I'm going to read it three times. If you have your phone and want to take a picture of this on the screen, do it. If you want to write it down, if you want to tweet it, if you want to tattoo it on your arm, whatever you have to do, this next sentence could change your entire life. Here's how he concludes the speech. He says this. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Third time, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. 
I wonder if for some of you that needs to be the sentence you pray a hundred times this Thanksgiving. So go, God, you've been faithful, but there's a scary thing ahead of me. I don't know what job I'm going to take. I don't know how this relationship's going to go. I don't know what's going to happen with my family or my health. I don't know how you're going to provide for me financially because I'm running out of money and rent's due next month. I don't know what's going to happen, God. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I wonder if this needs to be the prayer of your heart. I wonder if this needs to be the prayer you write on your bathroom mirror or put in your car or make the screensaver to your phone that you would pray this over and over and over again. Again, Christian faith is not about pretending you have all the answers. Christian faith is about you saying, God, there are scary things out there, but because you've been faithful, I'm gonna keep my eyes on you and I believe you're gonna continue to be faithful in the coming year. We don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. Verse 13 says this. It says, All the men of Judah and their wives and their children and little ones stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, the Levite, the descendant of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all of Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. And I wonder if what the Lord's about to say is the message anyone got brought here tonight to do. I don't believe anyone here is here by accident tonight. I believe the Lord God at some point drew you to here. Even if you come here every week, God brought you to here at some point. And I believe God wants to speak this over someone tonight. Here's what he says, and here's what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. That is the truth of the word of God. It is the truth of the gospel. That being a people of faith does not make us a people without problems. It makes us a people without fear. That we would be fearless people. Our desire for you as a young adults ministry, as a church, as people living in this world, isn't that everything would go well in your life and you would never have any problems. It's that you would be the type of person who says, all these things are happening, but I'm not afraid. Because this battle isn't mine, it's the Lord's. And I wonder for some of you, if you've gotten that mixed up and you say the battle isn't the Lord's, it's mine. And so you've been trying to deal with this and you've been trying to talk about it and you've been trying to fix it more than you've been trying to look to the Lord on it. I wonder if some of the anxiety in your life comes from the idea that you've forgotten that this battle you're going through right now, it's not yours. It's the Lord's. He's already given you promises. He's already promised his presence. He's already told you he's never going to leave you. That's the speech that's given. The Lord comes on this man, and he stands up, and he says, we don't have to be afraid. Verse 16, it says, tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge of the desert of Jurel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. God, go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. I love the command here. The command is that you would go out and face them, that you would face that thing down. That terrifying, overwhelming, scary thing down. And I love here, there seems to be a command and something connected to the command. The command is, go out and face them tomorrow. Meaning, get up, wake up in the morning tomorrow, and go out and face that thing that terrifies you. And then the thing connected to the command is this, and the Lord will be with you. So it seemed to me that there's some kind of connection between your capacity to face down the things in your life and the presence of our Lord, our God. And I just wonder if for some of you who are saying, I don't feel God's presence, and I don't feel like God's with me, and I don't feel like he's going with me, I wonder if you've actually faced down anything in your life. In other words, I wonder if the reason you're not experiencing the presence of God is because you're not actually putting yourself in any kind of position where God's presence needs to be there. I wonder if some of you have made your life so safe, so easy, so comfortable, where you never do anything, where God's presence has to show up or you'll die. God's presence has to show up or everything's going to fall apart. I I promise you the moments in my life where I felt God's presence just so thick and so present and so close aren't the moments where I'm taking it easy and not taking risks and not doing anything hard. The moments I feel God's presence the most are where I stand against scary, terrifying, overwhelming, anxiety-riddled situations and step into it with confidence because I believe God's going to be there. 
And I just wonder for some of you, if the first step to you experiencing God's changing, transforming power and presence in your life is you taking the step of faith that Jehoshaphat is calling them to take, that you would go out and face that thing, that you would face it down, that you wouldn't be afraid because God's presence goes with you, because the Lord goes with you wherever you you go. Verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat bows down with his face to the ground, and all of the people of Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and the Korahites stood before and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Because I'll tell you what the presence of God brings about. The presence of God always brings about worship. And when we say worship here, we don't mean like you stand there and you sing the songs and you bob your head and you kind of sing just loud enough so you can hear yourself but the person next to you can't. Here's what the presence of God brings about. It brings about a reckless kind of worship. It brings about a shameless kind of worship. We go, God's in this place and I'm going to worship and I don't care what anyone else thinks. That's our desire in this room. Like we sang a few songs just now. We'll sing a few songs after this sermon. Our desire isn't that you just kind of stand and tap your foot and kind of think about worship. It's that you would sing with a loud voice, that the presence of God would actually bring you to your knees, that you would fall flat before the Lord, that you would shout out to him because his presence is here, because his presence goes with you wherever you go. Verse 20 says this, says early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. They set out, and Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, that you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Verse 21, after consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. It's my favorite part of the story. And I'll explain why. You got this king and his army, and they're over here, and there's this other army that's over here, and there's about to be this massive battle on the field that's going to be filled with shields and swords and blood and spears and just all sorts of craziness. And here's what Jehoshaphat does with his army. He's got his whole army lined up, and then he decides, okay, who's going to go first into battle? Who's going to lead the battle? And he's like, hey, where are the worship leaders at? That's what he says, Right? He's like, all right, uh, Robbie, you'll do okay. Kylie, you'll do <laughs> Jacob, like you too. Um, you know, like puts them up here, right? They put the worship leaders up front. Like what an utterly ridiculous thing to do to put the people who sing the songs up fr- in front of the people who have the swords. But that's what they decide to do. They march into battle with the worship leaders going first singing songs and all of the people with swords and spears and shields behind them. See, something's happening here. These worship leaders are marching into battle and they're singing a song, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. You see, in this moment, they aren't praising God because the battle's already won. They're praising God because it will be. They're praising God not in response to what he did. This isn't a responsive praise. This is a proactive praise. This isn't worshiping God for what he's already accomplished in my life. This is worshiping God for what he will accomplish in my life. I hope you see that. I hope that stirs you today. They're marching into battle and they're singing, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because his love endures forever. They are marching into the scariest moment of their entire life and they're thanking God because the battle's already his. Here's what I wonder for you at Thanksgiving next week, for your Friendsgiving as you get together with someone this week. I wonder if you would go around the table and do what we all do, where we thank God for something he did in the last year. But then I wonder if you take a second pass around the table and thank God for what he will do in the coming season. I wonder if for some of you, you have to say, I'm grateful because God showed up and he provided this and he gave this and he's done overwhelming and good things, but I'm just going to praise God because I'm not super healthy right now, but I believe God's going to heal me. I'm going to worship him for that. I'm going to praise God because I have no idea where I'm going to go to school next year, but I'm going to praise him because God's already got this. That battle's his, not mine. I feel single and lonely and totally unwanted right now, but I'm going to praise God because I'm believing there's going to come a time where where, where I'm going to be fulfilled in this deeply, fully satisfied in love. 
I wonder if some of you need to go around the Thanksgiving table this year and not just thank God for what he's done, but proactively praise him for what he will do. This is the scene. The army is marching into the battle, and they've got the worship leaders out front singing songs, and you're watching this scene and just thinking about these two armies racing at each other, and you've got Jacob and Robbie and Kylie out front. You're going, what's going to happen here? Here's what occurs. Verse 22 says, they began to sing and praise the Lord. Then praise. And the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Okay, there's times I read the Bible and I have no idea what it means. Right? It doesn't say here like the Lord allowed the army to win. So maybe it wasn't even the army that won, but it says he sends ambushes. So was it angels? Was it God sent fire? Was like some other people came and like destroyed them? It doesn't say because it doesn't matter. God is going to use whatever he needs to use to accomplish his will in your life and in mine. And God will win the battle because he can win the battle and he does win the battle. The story of the Bible is that God shows up over and over and over and over again and wins the battles that weren't yours to begin with. That's the story of the Bible. That's the story of proactive praise, that we believe God will because he can. We believe that that will come to pass because that is God's desire that it will. The proactive praise says, this hasn't happened in my life yet, but I believe that God can, and I believe that God will. I, I want to finish by looking at an objection or a question or a something that may run through some of your minds. And, and what I'd like to do is invite our band back up. And in a moment, we're going to have some time for some proactive praise where, where I hope your praise is not just for what God has done, but what he will do as you look into the next year, the next many years, the next season of your life, believing that God will do everything he promised, believing that the battle is his. It's not yours. The Lord has this battle. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be discouraged. But then I wonder if some of you are asking the question, and it's a good question, and it's the right question. Brian, are you promising that he's going to win? Like, what if, I, what if I don't get the job? What if I can't afford rent? What, what, what if I never get married? What if I never get healthy? What if I deal with this addiction for the rest of my life? What if this doesn't come to pass? Are you just creating false promises now? And here's what I want to give you tonight as we close. I want to show you one final scripture where people are singing. And they're singing at the top of their lungs. They're screaming out to the Lord their God. It's in the third to last chapter of the entire scriptures. It's a vision that John has of heaven, the vision that John has of eternity. And I believe in this vision of heaven, in some strange and miraculous way, he was able to see into eternal heaven. And in some way, I believe he was able to see me and you and anyone in this room who calls themselves a Christian. Anyone in this room who is a part of the family of God, a son or daughter of the king, here's what it says. John says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, with like loud peals of thunder, shouting hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. I read this passage and I'm reminded that this is my future. I'm reminded of what's going to happen. See, I was reminded of a year ago at Thanksgiving, my wife and I were in the process of, of beginning to want a family and beginning to say, we've been married for a few years now and we just want to, we want to bring a child into this world. And maybe you've known people who've walked through this process. It sounds like a fun process and, you know, it is. But in other ways... It's a difficult process. It is. Because month after month after month, you realize you're not pregnant and you're disappointed. And while the emotions for me are strong, for many women, the emotions are so much stronger and so much deeper and there's pain and there's hurt and there's worry and there's wonder. Is this ever going to happen? Is it ever going to happen for us? Is God ever going to bless us with a child? And last Thanksgiving, we're right in the midst of that. Last Thanksgiving, we're right in the midst of thinking, is God ever going to give us a child? Are we ever going to get to be parents? But then I just think of the last year. In January, when I get told by my wife that, that she's pregnant, when we get to see the ultrasound for the first time or find out it's going to be a girl, 
or find out she's healthy or get to see her born for the first time and hold her in our hands and play with her at home and feed her and love her and pick her up and rejoice in her. I think of the last year of my life and all of the joy that's brought forth and I look back to me at Thanksgiving of 2016 and I look back at that Brian and I look back at that Danny, my wife, and I, I look at the two of us together and I just wonder what would have happened if we had known all of the rejoicing we would do now and we decided not just to be anxious and worried about it, but if we just decided to praise before it happened. If last fall we had said, you know what, this hasn't happened yet, but there will come a day when it does happen, when, when, when we do get to rejoice and celebrate in this, and we celebrate it because we knew what was going to happen. If I could go back in time and say, Brian, if you had any idea how beautiful and wonderful and spectacular it was, you would begin your worship and celebration now. And I think John, in his vision of heaven, wants to reach back into now and go, if you had any idea what heaven was going to be like, if you had any idea what it would be like when we were rejoicing before the king of the universe, you would begin your worship now. You would begin your praising now. You would begin your worship ahead of time because God's already going to do it. He's already going to rescue you. So hear me on this. Even if that thing you're believing for doesn't come to pass, God is still going to bring you to a place of praise. Like, hear me on this. Even if you don't get that job you think you should get, you still have a place in the household and the kingdom of God forevermore. Even if the money doesn't come through and you can't pay the rent, you still get to inherit the kingdom of God. Even if you don't get married and have that wedding you always thought you have, you still get invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And even if you don't get healed from that thing that's bothering you, that thing that may take your life, you still get resurrected with Christ on that last day. This is why we praise in advance. Because whatever happens tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now or 50 years from now, 100 million years from now, you and I will be standing before I, God, and we will praise him saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And if that's how we're going to praise then, why not begin that tonight? Why not begin that proactive praise in this place, in our lives, this Thanksgiving, this fall? What if we started praising God for what he has not yet done because we know he will, because his promises are sure and we rest in them. He has been faithful, we believe he will be faithful, and we praise him believing that he is the God who is above all things, not because he's done great things, but because he is great and he's worthy of our praise. If you would stand with me right now as we go before the Lord in praise, as we go before the Lord in worship, would you stand with me and believe that Christ is worthy Worthy of our praise and God is worthy of our worship, not just because of what he's done, but because of what he will do in your life, in your existence, in all of eternity, that we will praise him together. If you would, and if you're believing that your praise is not just reactive to what he's done, but proactive to what he will do, would you raise your hand in worship right now, raise your hand straight into the sky and believe that God can and believe that he will. Lord God, we come before you, we cry out to you, and we don't always know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And so God, we trust you in the battle. We trust you in the pain. We trust you in the anxiety. We trust you in the depression. We trust you in the loneliness. We trust you in the financial struggles. We trust you in every moment of our lives, believing that now and forevermore, you will win the battle because it's yours. God, may our praise be proactive to the glory of your name and the gladness of our hearts as we sing to you now. Be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, 